Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Rose City Politics. It is January the 19th. We have a full panel tonight. Myself, John Lidke, Doug Sartori. Doug, how you doing? Very well, thank you. Glad to have you here. We got Don Merrifield Jr. Don, how are you doing? Very good. Uh, just want to say happy birthday to my son. He turned 21 yesterday, so I'm feeling old today, Johnny. Oh, mazel tov to your son. Is he going to cross you. the border and go get really drunk and then cause like a public health crisis because you're going to have to breach quarantine to go pull him back or something? You know, fun fact, with me as his father, he doesn't drink. I don't get it either, but mm. you think he'd be drunk all the time. <laughs> well, happy birthday to your son. We have Pat Papadeus here. Pat, how are you doing? Doing well. We are here tonight. We're talking Ward 3, Episode 3 of our Ward Watch 2022. Support us on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Rose City Politics. We are in BizX and online at bizxmagazine.com. And we are on all of your favorite social media and podcasting apps. And Rose City Politics is able to broadcast live on tape thanks to the kind support of Leuna 625 Building Better Communities. We are talking Ward 3. Every one of us on the panel tonight either lives in or works in or a combination of both in Ward 3. Um, so we've got a, you know, a breadth of, uh, of personal knowledge here about Ward 3. We didn't think that we had to bring anyone on the panel tonight to discuss it. Um, so we're going to follow the same format that we did last week, where we're going to have Doug, who has compiled some information for us. He's going to do a bit of table settings. And you know what? I'll just bring you in right now, Doug, and you can explain for those who haven't already been listening what they will be learning about. Sure thing. Um, we're going through the demography of the ward based on Statistics Canada information, as well as past election results going back to the early 1990s. The demographic data is from the 2016 census. Somewhere on our journey through these wards, we will get updated data. And uh, at that time, uh, if we're feeling particularly ambitious, we'll put together a nice, a nice post with all of the demograph demographics uh, that, that we have. So Ward 3, total population in 2016, 19,766. Uh, that was a growth of about 600 people over 2011. Um, the density per square kilometer in Ward 3 is 5,749 residents per square kilometer. It is the most densely populated ward in the city, no surprise there. 17.8% of the population is under 19 years old, middle of the pack. 18% of the population is over 65, also roughly middle of the pack. 1,295 single parent families, 82.6% of those are led by women. The median after-tax income in Ward 3 is 20,523. The average after-tax income is 25,182. Uh, just a little bit above Ward 2, um, but definitely a high concentration of poverty in parts of Ward 3. The low income rate is just under 45%. And 33.5% of the population is in the bottom income decile, the bottom 10% of income earners in Canada. And 2.5% of the population is in the top income decile. Uh, that's, that number is a little bit higher than Ward 2. Ward 2 had 1.67% in the top 10, but rough parity between the two wards in terms of the percentage of the population in the bottom 10% of income earners. 10.3% of Ward 3 residents use public transit to reach employment, just slightly below the Ward 2 number of 12%. Um, and the top industries of employment in Ward 3 are manufacturing, retail, and accommodation and food services. Okay, looking at the, oh, I should mention, by the way, that that data comes to us courtesy of the wonderful series of blogs, Know Your Ward, that Fraser Fathers did back in 2018. No word on whether Fraser is going to update that this year, but we live in hope. 
Um, turning to the election results, 1991, uh, remember that these are results from the two or the five ward system. Uh, Donna Gamble was the winner, second Tom Porter. 1994, Donna Gamble came out on top again, second place earning a seat, Fulvio Valentinas for the first time. 1997, Fulvio Valentinas and Alan Halberstadt. 2000, Fulvio Valentinas and Alan Halberstadt. 2003, just for a change, Alan Halberstadt and Fulvio Valentinas. Uh, 2006, Fulvio Valentinas and Alan Halberstadt. Transition to the 10 ward system in 2010, Fulvio Valentinas, 2,342 votes. Tristan Fehrenbach, second place, 773. And a fellow named Reno Bordelin came in fourth place uh, in that year. In 2014, Reno Bordelin won the ward with 1660 over Gabe Maggio's 1409. And in 2018, Reno Bordelin was successful in winning re-election with 2,710 votes. And that's your roundup of data on the ward. Well, we dodged a bullet with that Maggio deal, didn't we? Yeah, it's really interesting. Oh, start the hate mail early. <laughs> why don't you? Well, it's really interesting, Don. Seems right? to be our and thing now. I, I think that there is there's um, there is a bit of insight there. Low turnout wards, um, weird things can happen. Um, and you see that in ward two as well. Um, and we talked about John Elliott's durable base of support that <clears throat> makes him kind of an eternal threat in ward two. Because if you can if you can round up fifteen hundred votes in Ward Two or Ward Three, you're dangerous. Also, I think uh, just just to note, uh, since you're going down that uh, memory lane there, Doug, that uh, that back and forth between Fulvio Valentinus and Al Alan Halberstad, Alan Halberstad's um, you know uh, straddled uh, where he could run in that uh, election, following moving from uh, ten wards to five. And uh, Fulvio Valentinus, of course, elected here, but uh, Alan Halberstadt went on to run in what is now Ward 4 and 1. So they both did come back in, in, in uh, 2010. Yeah. Can we talk a little bit more about how the ward changed and what the new ward, like what the ward system we're living in right now, the difference is? really dive into it. And Pat, I'm, I guess I'm looking more towards you on this one, you know, sitting on the BIA, because the, the biggest thing I'm trying to get at is in the prior ward system, the wards straddled Olette Avenue. And it was literally with one ward on one side, another on the other, which gave downtown two councillor votes, essentially, because it was one core area that was split into two. So I guess, you know, just from a political analysis point of view and perspective, how do you think things would have been different over the past little bit um, where, you know, I guess, you know, since it's changed, if it had remained in that kind of a system where it had that built in dual counselor support, do you think that we would have seen so many, you know, pushed things, uh, if it was that way? No, I, I actually don't. I don't think we would have seen as much. I, I think that this, this idea that there's one ward and, uh, and counselors feel that, they're speaking for that ward in that way and exclusively almost because you're not sharing that voice, if you will. I, I think that there are advantages and disadvantages to that. I, I still think that we see some disadvantages. You'll see um, even as recently as Monday's meeting when suddenly you have an issue that in fact in, in, impacts an entire community and we should be zooming out to look at that lens. Uh, what you have is, um, in fact, uh, counselors who are talking specifically about how it might impact their ward, as if that they have to say that. Um, but uh, I, I feel those of us that <laughs> thought you were coming to me because you're taught you're the oldest. Um, but I, I do remember the discussions back then, and uh, we, you know, back then we were on C Jam Radio. I mean, this all we're talking about, but. There, there were a lot of things that were not happening because two uh, counselors in one ward, oftentimes they were at odds on what should happen. So that was fascinating. Um, there was uh, one upping of one or the other. There were other reasons why um, sometimes it, it didn't really work. But I think that the way that this particular ward has broken down, uh, it's much more clear. It, it encompasses truly the downtown core, all of it. And um I, I think that 
in, in the way that it's been divided uh, now, um, the issues, uh, in fact, especially when we look at the urban part of the core, um, mind you, it's all urban uh, in, in War Three. It, 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 you really have a, an opportunity to um, gauge it that way from that lens, that entire piece there. I, I think War Three specifically, and I would have to really think about the other ones. I'm not sure I would say this for the other ones, but I think it worked for War Three. I think that that worked. Do you th actually, just a follow up question. Do you think when there was two counselors because the ward was so big? you could actually not focus on the downtown and still win your election. 100%, basically. absolutely. In Whereas fact, you I, can't I, do that now. Like, Reno, like the council or whoever's here has to focus on downtown. Absolutely. And, you know, it's really interesting. I guess we can talk about Ellen Halberstadt's career and when we get to the next one in Ward 4. But um, I think, you know, it, he had a choice that he could run in Ward 4 and um, he could take a look and say, okay, which voters, right, am I more likely... Um, to get votes from what demographic and, and even now you can take a look at any award. I mean, Doug could do this analysis for us or Frazier too, I'm sure could come up with data. But when you do take a look at the pockets of demographics which, within a particular ward, well, then um, what ends up happening is you can focus on one where the votes are um, in coming for election. If that's, if that's, I'm sure, you know, part of that was part of the war two discussion too. But um, in this particular case, I think that it's really benefited downtown because you really had to um, take a look at, at, at how it's being impacted. And frankly, um, in many ways, I would say that there's two things happening in War 3. Number one, the way that it's been, the, the map was redrawn, but also, and, uh, you know, we, we do commend him a lot, but we are talking about War 3. The... Uh, extraordinary representation um, by Reno Bordelin in War Three, frankly. Thanks for that perspective there. And, you know, I guess let's let's shift to talking about some of the issues before we get into some of the political analysis and sort of put together a bit of a grab bag of the top issues that we've talked about over the past uh, term of council. Um, but I don't think it'll surprise anyone here that we're going to start out talking about the consumption and treatment site uh, vote and issue that just happened at City Council. Um, it fits in neatly with this topic and we get to talk about, you know, some actual current uh, events rather than just looking back entirely. Yeah, you know, I, we're, we're going to try to get over all of these topics. There's a lot here, Doug. I'm being very optimistic. Um, let's just start with the votes for the consumption treatment site. Obviously, we're talking about downtown Windsor, Goyo at Wyandotte. The votes as they came in, Francis, no. Costante, yes. Borland, yes. Holt, yes. Geniac, no. Morrison, yes. Mackenzie, yes. Gill, no. Sleeman, no. Kashuk, yes. Dilkins, no. Um, what was most interesting about this, I thought, was that we had Councillor Holt when I was tuning in. It was just such an apropos quote from him saying, we've have the ward councillor here referring to Reno Borderland because we've had the ward councillor here asking for this in his ward. I've never seen anything like this. It's a slam dunk, but we're debating location here. And I think that's a really good place for us to start off with this topic. Have any of you guys ever seen something like this? I mean, you have counselors here that are saying they don't want it at this location downtown. My first reaction was, why is one of these counselors not turning to Counselor Geniac and saying, fine, let's do it in your ward? Yeah, well, that's right. one way to look at it. Another way to look at it how, is how interesting it is when um, an external body, in this case, the local health unit, goes through a process, a site selection process, um, spends some time and energy uh, uh, picking a site, it comes to council and they want to debate that location. Um, and it's really interesting that that has happened in another context in recent years at the Windsor City Council and the votes lined up the opposite way. Um, I, I find that really fascinating. You know, when we're talking about um, uh, the location of a hospital, um, the, there was, you know, there was a process, there was debate about that process. And then when it came to council, 
Um, they were meant to vote on that without their without paying attention to the location or without consideration to the location. But now, when something that the city needs, just like it needs health care, when something that the city needs, another health care location comes to council, um, those, some of those same voices are, are only able to talk about the, the problems and challenges with the location and can we possibly find a better location? I just found that really interesting. Trigger me. Just, 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 just start right off the top. Um, <laughs> somebody, somebody the other day said anybody who thinks that the hospital isn't going uh, on to 42 and there's any way that, that that entire plan to shut down two hospitals and, and hold on for your, uh, to your hats, those are going to read Bizzix magazine uh, next month because you'll call me delusional on that front. Um, but 100%, Doug, uh, Fred Francis uh, talks about I want a fully formed model before I agree. This is about a CTS site, which uh, a comprehensive report and, and consultations, uh, by the way, with all stakeholders, regardless of what, you know, what, what stakeholders uh, thought in the end. Uh, but the, the no question that the consultation was good and the report was thorough and they did a lot of research and they did a lot of homework. And yet, uh, and something we cannot say, uh, about the hospital uh, decision. And Joanne Geniak, same thing, decision of a lifetime must be done right. Well, uh, you know, I, I definitely agree that the CTS site is, is very, very important and uh, has impact on lives, but whether it's a decision of a lifetime, please, it's not like we're shutting down six other CTS sites and, and, and uh, parks and pools and all sorts of things that they've done. Um, I'll, I'll say this, uh, for full disclosure, I'm the vice chair of the Downtown Windsor Business Improvement Association. I think a lot of people know that, but uh, I'll put it out there because in, in getting to your comment, John, about um, how it may seem counterintuitive in many ways that your uh, city councillor, you know, what others, imagine if, if this was going to go in Ward 1 or Joanne Geniac's work, can you imagine such a thing? They'd be like, oh, it should be downtown, anywhere downtown, <laughs> right? Put it on Maiden Lane. Um, so it, it's just fascinating, the, the hypocrisy. But, um, you know, it's really interesting. The previous downtown Windsor BIA board did not support a CIS site in the uh, core uh, commercial district of the BIA. And uh, this... Uh, that when the new board, which is now you know three years old, heading into its fourth year, uh, looked at it, there was definitely a shift, as many of you know, that followed that saga, uh, a shift in uh, the types of folks that were elected to the BIA board, and um, we took a really big picture, big view picture of what this is, and it's not about my business. Um, my corner, my little plot of the world, it really is about thinking about things as a community, as residents, as businesses, as, as everyone, and really taking a look and saying, um, what is the right thing to do and how can we work with it to make sure it is under the circumstances the best that we can be doing. Um, you know, I, I know that uh, Councillor Morrison uh, took a trip in order to see what others are doing. I also took a trip uh, to Toronto um, uh, to see uh, SIS sites, as we called them then, um, and uh, had the real uh, opportunity to meet with a lot of stakeholders, including police and transit and outreach workers and folks working in SIS. Um, BIAs, of course, and uh, what was really, really important and in, in one BIA where there were six SIS sites, and there was a clear um, uh, understanding of which sites worked and which didn't, and the ones that didn't work were the ones where they were placed there without the type of consultation that was necessary, and how important that is. So this is what we got here, and uh, everyone was involved from police to the health unit to the BIAs, for sure, um, the, the uh, immediate businesses that might be impacted would not be pleased about that. But then we have, you know, McDonald's is right across the street and um, uh, supporting. We know the area, the issue. Where can you find a site that's going to be in downtown? And I'm looking at Ed Sleeman now specifically, who not only um, um, voted against it, but is on the health unit board, which of course was bringing this forward and did all the work to find the location. 
Um, and no, by the way, nobody wanted to um, sell property or to give property uh, for this, this reason, even though, uh, Dawn, you'll know, you know, there are people who are looking to, to, to sell property and yet real concerns about um, the properties being uh, a, a CTS site. So there, it was a very complex and um, formidable real, really um, project initiative to work on to get to this final result. And for somebody like Ed Sleeman to know uh, that process and to come forward and say, he thinks there could be a better location. Well, if you're going to say you're gonna keep it in Ward 3 or downtown specifically, where is it that you're not going to impact some business or residents, where? So that's going to happen. Uh, I, I found what I did observe and, and I, I sort of scanned through the video of city council enough to um, get my blood pressure going uh, in some cases, fascinating. I do want to say um, that the criticism that we've had on the show before, uh, or at least I have, I'll just speak personally, of Ed Sleeman, I'm sorry to say, was in, in broad display because here you have a member of council who um, is also on the board of the health unit, whose proposal this is, whose report this is, and yet you are going to be whipped by the mayor in your vote. That is appalling. So let me just tack on to the end of that there. At the September 21 health unit board meeting, um, Reno Bordelin applauded the efforts of the health unit and the entire CTS committee and is eager to see the initiative proceed further talking about the two addresses at 101 Wyandotte Street East and 628 Goyo Street moved by Councillor Bordelin seconded by Councillor Sleeman. So I mean, it's, it's not even like he was just there and voted yes for it. He, he was the one who's recorded as having actually brought it to a vote as the seconder. I mean, the hypocrisy. And Pat, I mean, as you said, it's just it's a whipped vote. We know that. But how does this is now another a second huge hit, in my opinion, to Councillor Sleeman. And it's, you know, it's following a streak of them. Just the, the lack thereof independence. It would be really interesting to to know how often this happens that um, a council member sits on a committee, votes for um, a particular recommendation, and then turns around and votes against it on council or I guess the opposite. I would imagine that that is a pretty damn rare thing. And, uh, and I'm glad that you took note of it, John, good work. Thanks, it's just, it's just, it sticks out like a sore thumb. Also, which sticks out like a sore thumb, there was a quote that Mayor Dilkins gave during the proceedings. I want to just talk about this quote, and then I think we'll be able to move on. Um, Mayor Dilkins was saying, quote, there were a lot of voices speaking for those who are addicted to drugs. And I think someone also needs to speak for the businesses. Um, Aside for what a reprehensible statement it is and how it's completely in line with, uh, you know, his, his, it tracks with what the mayor has said before about, you know, cannabis users when he went to uh, Denver and he said he saw a bunch of uh, riffraff and undesirable types that were cloistered outside of retail stores. And now to just be calling these people, you know, people addicted to drugs. I mean, this is a consumption and treatment site. We're talking here about people that are, you know, consuming, but also the ability to receive treatment. What do you guys think about that comment? Does it track or is he just, I mean, do you think it tracks with him? And then second to that, is he just campaigning here? So we well, were- um, may I, Yeah, may I, may I jump in here for a second, Doug, just on this comment alone? The first part of the reha- how reha- reprehensible that comment is, um, I think is self-evident. Um, I think it was Reno Bordelin that talked about, you know, we were talking about opening up a cancer clinic. I don't think we would have seen, you know, the need to look at the other side. Um, I, I don't even know what, 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 you know, so, but, but in selecting that the other side is businesses, um, here's a news flash for you, uh, Mayor Dilkin. There is an organization that represents businesses right there. Uh, it's called the Downtown Windsor Business Improvement Association. Um, hello. And it supported it. I think what, what you uh, he meant to say is that there are a couple of businesses that, of course, um, would be against it. Just like anywhere that you would go, you would find, you know, um, 
unfortunately, there's going to be a few. This is not to in any way take away from um, the very, how those business owners feel, um, but it but it, it's to say that this is not sort of this broad view that had to be taken, that this is anti-business. In fact, what's anti-business is that we've been waiting so long to start to address the very issues um, that we're seeing here uh, and are impacting uh, the community and the, the business district in the downtown core. So I, I just want to add, um, I was watching that comment from Mayor Dilkins as I was preparing for this show and thinking about yeah. the issues that have come up in Ward 3 and the, um, you know, the different, uh, the different initiatives that have been brought forward in Ward 3, um, particularly by the mayor. And it kind of struck me that the guy just never stopped being the Ward 1 counselor. Um, these are comments that would be, you know, make more sense coming from uh, a counselor in a peripheral ward, just as Joanne Geniak made similar comments. Um, but it doesn't make sense coming from the mayor of a city that is in the midst of two public health crises, um, an opiate crisis that has been ongoing for many years. And, um, you know, if it's not, if it's not a CTS, then what is it? Um, and I was not convinced by uh, Mayor Dilkins' advocacy for um, locating the CTS at um, the, the homeless hub. Uh, I wasn't convinced by that. And simply because this has been such a long and public process, and um, there were many opportunities for Mayor Dilkins to bring that idea, that concept forward over the past months and really years um, since at least since the um, the the hub concept was brought forward and to my knowledge it hasn't happened so to bring to come in at the 11th hour and just throw sort of throw some mud in the water and and try to confuse things uh, I think is really disappointing look to me um, you know to have a mayor who uh, sits there and says that he wants to speak to businesses when uh, the investment when the opportunity presents itself of millions and millions of dollars uh, for bright lights went to a park in the middle of nowhere that would benefit no business other than possibly Wendy's, but even then, no, um, uh, is laughable to me. So uh, please stop speaking for who you either don't know anything about or, um, um, you know, this is just politics. This is just absolutely uh, offensive, frankly, to, to be talking out of both sides of his mouth in that way. I don't want to leave uh, Councillor One for uh, Fred Francis off the hook on this, uh, despite the fact that he's out there. He's still a city councillor. And to me, his comments were also very offensive. Um, I scanned them just before this, um, before we met today. And I think it's, uh, I'll try to find out where the where it is. But he, at one point, um, actually says, uh, he's talking to the, um, uh, second chief, I'm sorry, I forget the name now, um, the second chief of the police, um, which while I'm thinking about it, because I'm all over the map today, obviously, is let's not forget that Mayor Dilkins is also chair of the police board who also supported it, right? Like, I mean, it, it, it's really fascinating some of the dynamics that were happening here. But Fred Francis specifically asked whether, what would police do um, if, you know, um, there were issues there and uh, to which the the answer was well what what police do and that is that they take a look and see where the resources have to go and and they they do their job and so you know this was sort of his uh i guess you know cross-examination 101 style or something where you know he sets up the question to essentially uh come back with so you're telling me that this in effect could take resources away he didn't say from other communities or other neighborhoods or whatever. He specifically went right to like Southwood Lakes, you know, like Ward 1, his backyard. So you're telling me that um, resources may be taken away from the most affluent in the community. <laughs> um, uh, 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 to, it was unbelievable. This is, you know, going harkening back to my comment, John, about, you know, that's a double-edged sword, this idea that counselors think that they represent uh, an area, they speak for the, you know, the everyone, they get to pick and choose who are the uh, cool kids and who can just like, whatever, uh, forget no bus for you and all things like that. But um, uh, Fred Francis's comments are just so 
eye opening for anyone who hasn't been paying attention. Please go watch that um, and take a look and hear what he is saying. Uh, it's just unbelievable to me. I'm going to say something really controversial here. I'm going to suggest that the reason he had to bring up Ward 1 to justify his answers is to try and sort of uh, at some point say, well, I was voting, I was protecting the interests of my constituents, etc. I'm going to say something more controversial about both the, uh, where the mayor stands on this and where Fred Francis stands on this. This proposed location, which they've just now voted and approved, is very close to the entrance of the tunnel, which is also where Duty Free is, which is where friends of the mayor and Fred Francis, and in fact, their um, campaign managers, etc. there are political and personal interests. Didn't John Elliott just say something like this happened to us recently on a Facebook post? That was the other guy. Oh, yeah. That was the other guy. Yeah, that was going to be my duly noted, Don. That, oh, sorry, sorry. I ruined everything. You know, if Fred is that, if Councillor Francis is that upset, I'd be more than happy to approve that it go in the Roseland Clubhouse since we're renovating it anyway. So, uh, perfect opportunity. Know, perfect opportunity. And, you know, but this is if, you know, if you've paid attention to politics in Windsor for a long time, this is par for the course. I mean, we can go back to Councillor Hillary Payne when we were talking about bulk item pickup. Well, it doesn't happen to my ward, so I don't care. Right. And then Councillor, I believe it was Councillor Francis gotten all an uproar because they saw some homeless guy with a shopping cart walking around South Windsor. Now it became a serious problem. We really have to deal with these issues. Uh, so it's one of those things, you know, if it happens downtown, nobody cares uh, because it doesn't affect them in the suburbs. Uh, so I, I think this just carries on now real estate, Don, not guy talking politics, Don. Look, I get it. Uh, if I own buildings in that area, like very close, yeah, it's going to affect your property values. But I'm assuming, and I don't know because I wasn't involved in the process, that the consultation that went on, Pat, with the BI, I'm sure this has been discussed for a long time. The owners in that area knew what was going down and what was going to happen. I don't know if they approved it. They didn't, but they got over. I don't know what the situation is. I understand the concerns, but to bring them up after the whole process is that's politics because that's just BS at that point. Well, for sure, there are already, um, just like there were, as you remember, with the cannabis shops and all sorts of things, um, uh, regulations about how uh, how close or not it can be to uh, certain other places, schools, um, daycares, etc. So when, when it all comes down to it, it is not an easy thing to find a location. And certainly we know there's going to be no location that's going to please everyone. Um, but I think, um, you know, my, I guess what I really didn't like about Monday's conversation, and, and by the way, Joanne Geniak took the other tack saying, you know, this is not limited to a particular demographic. We know that substance um, abuse, et cetera, whatever her words were, I don't want to put those words in her mouth, but I think it's something close to that, um, impacts everyone. And surely there's a different way that we could be doing it. Um, and, and even again, Fred Francis uh, about, you know, if somebody has, I, I don't know if the word was epiphany, <laughs> I don't think it was, but some awareness that they need help, then I don't think that the, it, they were just out to lunch, I'm sorry, on, on um, how they approach this issue. Um, I think that it primarily was, I think Fred Francis for sure had reasons to vote um, against it's this generally uh, because of where it was going, nothing to do really with Southwood Lakes, but he slipped that in or Ward 1 anyway. Um, and I think that for sure, Jew and Gill was whipped. And uh, so in, in essence was uh, for sure Ed Sleeman. And uh, so let's talk about uh, on the on the brighter side. Um, let's talk about uh, Jim Morrison and Gary, Ka you know, Kashuk and, and, and of course the the councillors that represent uh, the urban core, Fabio um, Reno, uh, Chris Holt. And actually, hold on a moment, we often think about him as uh, progressive and thinking we, he, that he's urban, but in fact, he's Ward 9 and that's Kieran McKenzie. But, you know, sort of reliable, um, um, reliable votes on when it comes to a lot of po public and or social issues in our community. Uh, Jim Morrison, um, you know, uh, Jim, I know thinks, you know, I was critical of him because I say, you know, sometimes he just doesn't care enough about an issue. But uh, what I did say was when he does do his homework and does do his research, he lands well. And so therefore, I do want to reiterate that that's what I said. And this is an indication of that. 
you know, I wouldn't have an issue like all the counselors that voted against it. And even the mayor who brought up their foolhardy opinions about the location after the fact, if they have free, if for years now they had been working to actually try and do something about this problem, about the homelessness problem, the addiction problems in the community, then you're completely within your rights to make comments about this whole situation, but they have done, and they collectively, the city has done nothing to deal with this issue for years and years and years. And this is the first time they're actually doing something. And then to actually push back on it after all this time is ridiculous because they've done nothing to this point. The locations aren't going to be in their wards, so they should be happy. They won't have to deal with us downtown riffraff in their fancy areas. No one's going to be skating on Southwood Lakes Lake when it's frozen, so the police won't have to be there. Uh, so I, I don't, I don't see what the issue is. This is just straight politics, and it's you know it's standard operating procedure for Windsor politics. I don't know that I would go so far as to say nothing. Um, they've done nothing as far as that is concerned, but I, I do think that. Um, I think that they do take a political approach to these issues instead of a humanistic approach to these mm -hmm. issues. Um, that consultation process, again, I, I want to reiterate, like, I mean, having a counselor who who's very ward is going to go in supporting it. And in fact, having the BIA de demonstrates that when people want to work in the community, you can reach uh, difficult, challenging and yet uh, the right decisions. Uh, as a BIA, we walked with police and did a consultation where we walked from location to location. Uh, sometimes you got to go there, you got to see it and not just consider, you know, does my friend have a place across the street? And is that what I'm going to be voting on? Let's move on to the next one. Um, that, that was your in to take the other part out if you need to. <laughs> um, la so last point. It. Last point I did want to make on this one, because you had brought it up, Pat, was just about the cannabis stores. I remember Councillor Geniak specifically at the beginning of it all pushing for a retail cannabis store in the downtown core because of the increased police presence and the fact that it was already a designated entertainment zone. And that was her justification for having something in the core whereas she didn't want it somewhere else. And the best quote that she gave just to talk about how you know hyperbolic these counselors can be with their clutching at their pearls, uh, specifically with Counselor Geniak, she predicted that a retail cannabis store would generate as much traffic as the temporary casino when it opened up on Riverside Drive. So, you know, maybe we don't have to listen to everything these people say uh, <laughs> as closely. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they can redirect all the resources that yeah. weren't used and they prepared for for the cannabis shops. <laughs> well, they yeah, them I mean, to it, Southwood Lakes. <laughs> if, if anyone has gone to any of the cannabis retail outlets in the city that are sprouting up everywhere, the constant gun battles and knife fights out front <laughs> is just it's horrendous. I don't know how any of us have survived this. The truth is, uh, on a more serious note, uh, the truth is that it, it does bring um, uh, in issues that we should be aware of um, in taking a look at CTS sites. I primarily uh, uh, am concerned about vulnerable folks who would like to be in there to um, consume um, and don't have the substance, which is still illegal, and um, how that works and uh, whether people are put in, 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 in dangerous or more vulnerable situations because of that. And that to me again is a community understanding that policing understanding that not from a policing perspective, but a community safety perspective and making sure um, all community members are safe, um, even those who uh, use CTS sites. Well, you again, you just think from the from the fiscal uh, conservative perspective from these folks on council, they would be for the fact that it is saving unnecessary ambulance visits and unnecessary police and fire visits. And that is keeping them available for other issues in the city. But, you know, we've talked about their faux fiscal conservatism before on the show. Um, we've got a bit longer if we want to keep going, but we can decide on that. But we should shift focus a little bit to some political analysis here. And Doug, I'll bring your voice in again to, uh, you know, continue your table. Didn't setting. Doug just call us all poor in the opening of the show a few minutes ago? Did I? <laughs> I don't think you, so. You ward three residents are all low income. Excuse uh, me, Mr. Roseland. 
just just the facts, Don. That's <laughs> statistics Canada, not me. Um, yeah, sure. I'll I'll start. So I think um, looking at the electoral history was a really interesting um, in, in the run up to this episode. You know, looking at um, Councillor Bordelin's result in 2018, which was a, a pretty crushing defeat um, for his two competitors. Um, and then comparing that to uh, just four years before 20 for 2014, when um, he won a close one against, uh, a, a, let's be honest, not a particularly credible or strong candidate. And I just find it really interesting um, at, and, and probably worth talking about. Um, should Councillor Bordelin choose to run again, and I have no reason to think that he won't, um, would you expect him to uh, be vulnerable, guys? I don't uh, see from where. No, me neither. As someone who's ran before against an incumbent, I wouldn't do that again. <laughs> right. Um, but not just any incumbent. Look at the difference. Between... No, he's very popular. Yeah. I mean, right. there's, no one's going to be Reno unless he does something really stupid in the next six months. Look at the difference. You know, we talk about the power of incumbency, and there's no question um, that incumbency uh, uh, ha has a lot of value. But it's also what you do with your time in office, and and that was the point that I wanted to make. You know, just after, just four years after, um, uh, Councillor Bordelin um, was, you know, barely won against Gabe Maggio. He absolutely crushed the competition, and part of that was keeping any credible. Um, opponent out of the race. There was, you know, nobody really um, worth mentioning as a as a, a, a political actor in the city who was willing to get in. And contrast that with um, with Fred Francis, who we talked about a couple of weeks ago. And um, you know what he was able to achieve in four years was um, was you know a very modest increase over his 2014 performance. And I'm really interested um, to see how that carries forward. Uh, I agree with you, Don. I, I expect that um, that Bordelin will cruise to re-election. Um, I, I don't see any challenger on the horizon, and I, I think that. Um, that just comes down to performance. If you're an incumbent and you're good and you do the work, um, you're really, really, really tough to take out. And I, I would expect that to hold true this fall. My well, signs will stay in my basement for another four years. So no concerns. Good for you, so. Don. Vote for Don. The, um, well, the, the key is, of course, we've talked about, uh, you know, the differences. Fred Francis uh, has one line, uh, has one, you know, one lens in which everything is, is looked at and that maybe works for him uh, if, if people are not really paying that much attention, I think mostly, uh, and are comfortable. And that's, that's actually, you know, how you could mostly describe his demographic uh, as well. It's comfortable. Um, but uh, Reno Bordelin's uh, ward is, is the one that has uh, similar to War II, uh, to a lesser, but also similar extents, some overlapping um, um, similarities with Ward 4. This is it. This is the downtown core. And I'm sorry if I'm going to say that I think that, and this is true of any city, not just Windsor, but the downtown core is really the heart, the heartbeat of any community. When people say Windsor, they don't think of, with all due respect, Forest Glade. You think of a downtown when you think of a community, when you think of a city. And so this is why it's so important. I want to suggest to you that this pandemic could have been, and it has been devastating in many ways. So think about what, you know, we already, especially when you look at the naysayers and the comments on the, on people who don't visit downtown, but have an, a view of what it looks like and what it is. Think about actually the health of our downtown and how we are emerging from this pandemic um, in relatively good shape. I mean, as soon as the other levels of government get their things in order um, and, and we're able to start to open up when we do see, you know, the light at the end of this tunnel, we are actually in pretty good shape as a downtown core. And that's largely been because of some serious work with some new people down there, primarily under the leadership and building those community connections with all those stakeholders, like him or not, like his style or not, like his personality or not, but the, the, his 
uh, deep involvement and very uh, uh, in-depth understanding of the issues that impact uh, the downtown core in particular. And so we're going to emerge from that in a way that I don't think people could actually uh, 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 envision uh, if I said to you that downtown would have been devastating, think about pictures of downtown just a few years ago, pre-pandemic, let alone post-pandemic, and tell me how anybody would have went, oh, yeah, well, what do you expect if it was actually, um, you know, post-apocalyptic down there? And yet, that is not what we have. Uh, these are the things that can't be measured because you cannot see what it could have also been uh, um, and so that is a testament really to the uh, incredible work that he's done. So when uh, I don't know if, if voters, you know, are in terms of are sophisticated that that way to say, OK, I actually that's what I see and that's what I'm voting for, or maybe just a little um, simpler, not to say that you're simple, Don, but uh, a simpler sort of analysis, which is an incumbent. I know the name, whatever that is. I think that uh, he he's not going to face any serious uh, challenges uh, if he wants to run in War Three. I think really the more interesting conversation is given um, uh, what he's been able to accomplish um, is whether um, he's ready to move into another seat around that table. Yeah, and if you know, if we talking about downtown kind of pre and during and hopefully post pandemic soon. I mean, pre pandemic. I mean, we all are aware, like the issues that businesses had downtown, just trying to get a stupid license for a patio that didn't cost $8 billion every year for insurance, all the little things that, you know, people kind of want in a downtown area, you know, sit outside, have a drink, that sort of thing, patios, that, that was always such a contentious issue before the pandemic, then the pandemic comes along. And this isn't just specific to downtown, I guess, because Erie Street and all the other, they finally start letting businesses just do what they've always kind of wanted to do all along. And as horrible as this pandemic has been, one thing that it has shown, hopefully the city, and, you know, I'm giving them maybe more credit than they deserve. Hopefully they realize that all these things they were fighting all along that are now happening are good things and they should let them continue to carry on post pandemic because they've been a success and all hell didn't break loose. Like they expected if we actually shut a road down or, you know, we've let businesses put patios outside where people, there was always a million excuses why not to do this. Now they've had to let it happen just because of the situation. And hopefully, you know, it carries on after this and they don't go back to being obstructionists like they were before. Only Windsor would be able to take a look at all of the great things that have actually happened during this time and then decide, nope, we're going back to status quo because that's how it always worked for us. No reason to think this would work in the long term. Made in Windsor solution, Johnny. Yeah, you know, the patio fees, I think, are, uh, um, and, and of course, the extended patios as well. But the patio fees, um, if you think about the history of that issue, and how it played out uh, in the previous term. I, I think it's really interesting to think about the way that council as a whole, not the ward councillor, but council as a whole, the way that council as a whole, uh, and particularly um, through the leadership of the mayor, the way that it addresses downtown. Um, Joanne Geniak loves to talk about the many, many investments that have been made in the downtown. And, and in pure dollar terms, you can't argue with it. There, there have been um, significant funds sunk into investments. But to me, um, they're, they're always from an outsider's perspective. They are always investments that intend to make downtown into a destination, a tourist location, a place where people can, um, can visit, can go to the water park with their family or, or you know, take a swim in the canal or whatever it might be. But but not um, as a place to live, not as a neighborhood, not as a place where, where people do real business and real work. And, um, you know, I, I don't, I, it may be weird to hear me say this, but I, I think that Ward 3 is so disrespected by council as a whole um, in that uh, it's, you know, it's, it's treated as something external, as something that is a means to an end, not an end to itself. And I don't think that other wards with the possible exception of Ward 2, I don't think that other wards get treated that way. When there is an issue 
um, in you know name award in any other ward in the city, uh, you hear from residents. The voices of residents are are something that is solicited and it, and and it's make plays a major factor in the decision making of council. I just don't get that sense in the downtown core in Ward Three or in Ward Two, and I think it's an interesting dynamic. Of course, uh, I, I'll just <clears throat> I think this is well said, Doug. I, I I the other day, you know, I was reading about or was it last week the uh, closing down of Silver City, the theaters out there on Walker Road. You know, every time, and, and think about when I say every time, how actually not that often it's been. In fact, we've grown businesses in Ward 3 and in the downtown core over the course of the pandemic, for goodness sakes. This is, this is uh, frankly unbelievable. And yet, when there are businesses with other reasons, with businesses closed for a lot of reasons, but anytime a business closed downtown, or oh, we're going to have to have, you know, the 600 comments on the on the social media talking about hashtag shithole, who wants to be downtown? Um, it's just unbelievable. And that that sort of sentiment um, is also, I think, the responsibility of leadership. And that starts with the mayor who represents the community, who certainly has a lot of time to do media. Um, and um, and does promote the downtown when it suits his interests and when it makes it look like his own win and frankly, even really good ideas of others that lead to something that he gets to cut ribbons and do the announcements for, all good. I personally couldn't care less who takes credit, um, except that let's remember who those folks are when it comes down to thinking about how we, how we uh, reelect, or or elect or, or or do the things that we need to do as a community to make sure it's the right people with the right vision in place so that we're not fooled but um part of that um self-deprecating in such a negative way windsor thing um is actually continued by um and we see it around the council table it may not be said in the same way um but but, um, you know, we're all really sad and, oh, maybe we got some other ideas about things that happen in other areas. If it happens in the downtown core, it's because, oh, well, it's the downtown core. Yeah, I think it's one of those things where, um, at least from the perspective of um, certain politicians, including the mayor, uh, the perceptions of people who live outside the downtown matter more. Um, in terms of what happens downtown. And, and I think that the, the reason for that, um, at least partly, is because of voter turnout. Um, there is no scenario where uh, a, any recently elected mayor, where any mayor in the last 30 or 40 years is saying, my God, I am so lucky that the voters of Ward 3 were behind me, you know, or, or the, the voters downtown <laughs> were behind me, because because they vote at, um, because residents of Ward 3, and this is true also of Ward 2, which we talked about last week, because they vote at such a low rate, um, they, they are not an essential component of um, a mayor's plan to achieve victory. And the people who you talk to in your campaign um, tend to become the voices that you listen to throughout your time in office. And the, the people in Ward 1 and Ward 6, their opinions about downtown matter a hell of a lot more to Mayor Dilkins than the opinions of the people and the residents of the ward. It's very sure. insightful, very true, and very unfortunate, but I agree with you. A hundred percent. And look at, just, just to dive further into it, I mean, downtown is treated as, you know, almost like this Disneyland amusement park in terms of the assets that do get invested in. And it's easy to go, you were saying, you know, just point to what the investments are, you know, community museum, aquatic center, adventure bay, art gallery, capital theater, but look further beyond that as well. I mean, how do you get downtown? You take Olette Avenue and they put up all the lights along the corridor there at Dougal. The whole thing is set up as an entrance to an event that you drive into. I mean, and I agree with you, and it's to the detriment of the people who actually live in the ward because they're not the ones that are being, you know, pandered to. And I use the word pandered for a you know very specific reason. Um, where do we want to go from here, though? We have a little bit of time left. Well, I'm going to give Ward 3 resident on the ground kind of opinion on something. Uh, 
Yeah, I talked to I talked to counselor about this a few times. Look, I live I back onto a park. I have an alley. There's alleys everywhere downtown. Lighting has been a big issue for years and years and years. And you know, I'm not going to say someone get murdered down there because the former counselor will tell me to man up and it'll become a big issue. But there are issues that I, I was just speaking with a neighbor the other day, like his truck got broken into. But there, it's literally I'm looking outside right. It's pitch black outside, looking out my backyard. But you bring up something as simple as, you know, we need to put lighting in the alley for safety, for all kinds of various other reasons. And it becomes such a huge issue for those other counselors who don't live in the ward. But at the same time, we talk about fancy lights for Southwood Lakes. And if we say no, it becomes an outroar. If we talk about why are we spending more money at the Roseland Clubhouse, it becomes, well, you guys hate the city and you should all, you know, you're all horrible people. But once you get, as John said, outside in the made downtown, there are some issues in the community that are continually neglected because as we've all kind of said, the other counselors don't really take Ward 3 serious. And I think, you know, what Doug has said is, you know, come up many times over the years. It's a voting that, you know, if you don't vote, yeah, you know, you don't get, you don't people, the ward, the counselors don't pay attention to you. So it's unfortunate that they can look at the downtown as a completely separate entity that doesn't involve them at all and just dismiss it as much as they do when they're when downtown Councilor Mordon just asked for some of the most basic services and needs of the community that is assumed not only is assumed in some place like Southwood Lakes they're debating how fancy the lights are going to be in Southwood Lakes not whether they get them at all right but when um when a name comes up in uh you know protesting and complaining and first i'll back up first of all um the residents of southwood lakes when that lighting issue came up i could not believe the volume they were able to generate in terms of like the noise they made in the community for how few people it really was um and and when that happens when you hear that uproar and the politician goes and they punch the name into their um, their database from the last election and they see, oh, okay, this is, <laughs> this was one of my supporters. This is a person that voted for me. And I, you know, they, they confirmed that they voted, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that carries a lot of weight. And I, I don't want to beat this horse, but, um, you know, and I know there's a lot of reasons voter turnout is a really complex thing. And there are a lot of reasons that um, Ward 3 and Ward 2 have um, such a difference in terms of the the amount of turnout that they have versus other wards in the city and it, you can't and i'm certainly not trying to blame anybody and say you know you naughty naughty residents of ward three you don't vote enough but the plain fact is the engine of our democracy is the votes of the people on the ground and it is a major barrier to Ward 3 getting um its fair share of attention and it's and and having its own residents drive the agenda and drive the debate about what happens in the ward. A big part of that is because there, there just are not enough people in Ward 3 who turn up on election day to put their, put their ballot in a box. I think, I think turning up for election is, is um, a, a separate issue, not a separate issue. It's connected to this and it can definitely, but there could be a target in terms of advocacy. It will only help so much. But I really think that the, the matter is socioeconomic, uh, Doug. I mean, it's, it's right in the data that you um, presented for us at the top of the show that Fraser put together. Uh, when you have income at that level, and this of course is you know, a broad picture, a broad stroke of there's pockets of the ward, but that's not true. I live in a community where that would not necessarily be true of me and my neighbor. So let me be clear. Um, um, and by that, I simply mean, um, take a look at it overall. Well, folks are busy um, putting together enough money to make, keep the lights on and feed the family and buying the bus pass and, um, and in fact, don't uh, have time, unfortunately, to um, lobby. Uh, and so I'll keep the, the issue of the voting, which I think that we could do a better job um, encouraging people to vote and why they should feel that they can vote. And, and, and a lot of that has to do with inclusion and whether you feel any sense of ownership 
for the agency and all of that. But when you take a look at how easy it is, with all due respect for someone in Southwood Lakes with that level of income to spend, take a little bit of their time. Okay, um, let me see. I'll just take a little bit of my time that I would, you know, to clean my house. I'll just hire somebody to do that while I have a couple of hours left over so that I could advocate for really, really great, lovely lights right now. Um, you know, it really is time and money are those things. And um, uh, it's to me, it comes down to, um, you know, what is it? It comes down to that. It's the the income level, right? Um, and not because income level means you're less likely to care or be um, uh, care about the issues, but less likely to be, be engaged in the issues because there's so many other more important issues, frankly, immediately that impact one's life and one's family um, that have to be addressed. And frankly, um, you know, politics is great, but um, uh, it may may or may not get me that bus pass that I need. Yeah, absolutely agree, Pat, uh, with, with everything that you said. And I think um, it points to a problem in our city uh, that, that I think we don't talk about often enough, and that is the growing inequality. Um, right. the, the, um, the, the, the poorest people in our community, um, compared to the richest people, that gap is growing. Um, and yeah. I believe it's becoming more polarized in our community. And, and that's a problem, not just for voter turnout, but it's a problem for social cohesion in general. Um, one of the things that I, I think is um, really difficult for me personally is watching people who I know and respect who just do not have um, the, the level of, of understanding or empathy um, for the folks in different circumstances, folks in more difficult economic circumstances than they are. And I, I think that part of that is because as we become um, more polarized on, on uh, an income basis, people truly don't, you know, that you go down to Southwood Lakes and um, you sit in someone's living room in Southwood Lakes. And I just don't think that, that in general terms, those folks have a real understanding of what it's like to live in certain parts of Ward 2 or Ward 3, um, what the experience is like of their neighbors, you know, because we're all neighbors in this community, what the experience is like and what the challenges that they face are. And the reason that I believe that that is true is that if, um, if we could understand each other, if, if we could, could have a better view of the lives of others, we wouldn't resist so much things like basic transit system. Uh, you know, improving our transit system to um, to make it more possible for people to achieve their their personal economic goals and 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 move around the city that the way that they need to. I, I really don't think that Windsorites are are bad people. Um, I really don't, you know, and I, I just think that there is a limited understanding of how others in your community live. Um, and when you, you know, when you live in an environment that is comfortable, I think there's a tendency to assume that there's a level of comfort for everyone else in your community. And it, it just isn't true here. Um, and, and I don't know how we fix it, but I, I think that over the last couple of decades, this has become an increasing problem for Windsor. Well, I mean, we're talking about a lot of the same people who won't come downtown to go to dinner because they would have to walk a couple blocks potentially to a parking garage and put a dollar into a machine. So how are they possibly going to know anything about what downtown is unless they're driving by on Riverside Drive or ripping, ripping down Olet Avenue? I mean, it's... look, look, John, do you not understand how much car payments are in a Land Rover every year? You can't <laughs> afford to pay for parking downtown if you're making $1,200 car payments. And <laughs> To, to go to kind of Doug and Pat's point, sorry, I made a stupid joke there. I can't help myself. Uh, I think going forward, and again, this is a Don real estate guy coming out. I think those economic differences are getting narrower uh, just because of housing prices. The reality is to buy a house down here by where I live, you know, what would have been a $200,000 house, you know, six years ago is now a $400,000 house. And people who would have traditionally went to South Windsor Riverside can't afford it anymore. So those people have to buy where they can afford to buy. So I think the economic situation as far as uh, family incomes in this area is going to go up. Now that creates a bunch of other problems and, you know, we can't solve everything at once, but 
strictly speaking about the economic situation in Ward 3, I think going forward, that's probably going to change quite dramatically in not that long a time frame. Well, you went somewhere that I wanted to go as well, Don, with this. Land Rover payments? Land Rover payments. I mean, I didn't realize how expensive they were. I was looking for a new vehicle. Um, No, you know, we're looking at significant development. Pat, you touched on it from CIPs. Um, We're looking at the Hive. There's the Canada building. There's the securities building. Um, You know, hundreds of units across those three alone right now, 88 alone in the Canada building. Um, But Windsor Works calls for 3,000 units in the downtown core. So I guess, you know, putting on our future predicting ad here, going a bit further, Don, with where you were at, uh, these are going to be, you know, new units, presumably, uh, you, you can't really, you can't create something from nothing here from existing stock when they're calling for 3000 new ones. So what do you think these units are going to be? I mean, you're looking at what the prices are and what, what things are. My point being is if you bring 3000 new units into the core, let's say that that is, I don't know what, 5,000 residents, 4,500 residents in them. I mean, what's that going to do to shake up voting in ward three? And would that you know, sort of change the path that we've been on. I see all the microphone mutes turning off right now. I'll go first, just because I kind of just made that point. The demographics are changing here. I don't, I don't, I don't believe we're going to get 3000 units downtown in a quick time frame. but you are already seeing it again with housing prices, but also with the CIP developments that have happened. I mean, you look at that apartment building they built over uh, university in Crawford, I think it was, or Campbell. I mean, those weren't, those are $2,000 a month units. So you're not, you know, making $25,000 a year and living there. You're making you know, $80,000 a year and living there. So I, I, I think you're right, John. I think the more units that get built in the core or ward three is going to, is going to bring about change. And I think that'll also change the voting patterns down here. It's interesting. Um, one of the things that we talked about last week was the, um, the dire rate of voter turnout in the poll of Ward 2 around the university. 9% was roughly the turnout. Um, and, and you've got to think that a lot of that is attributed to student apathy. Um, you know, students have a lot going on. Um, this is a moment in their lives when they're very busy with a lot of things that aren't engaging in politics, generally speaking. Um, and so I'm curious and I wonder um, how many students have taken up residence downtown. Um, you know, the college and the university in recent years have um, built a significant number of facilities downtown. And I, I wonder how many students are living downtown and what impact that will have on turnout. Just speculating, I don't think that it will be as concentrated as it is in Ward 2. Um, and that's a big factor. Uh, I mean, that poll is almost irrelevant. I'm, I would wonder if anyone bothers to canvas in that poll, um, unless they, you know, they're just a completionist and they absolutely have to knock on every door because, um, you know, fewer than, than one door in 10 being a voter is a real disincentive to engagement. And I wonder how that will play out and if it's going to play out. I, I, you know, I don't know that much about the programs at the college and the university offer downtown, if they're the type of programs where students are choosing to reside nearby or if they have to commute back to the main campus. Um, but it is really interesting to think about. There's a couple of different things that are happening um, in Ward 3 that are evolving the the nature of the, you know, the landscape of residents. And, um, some of them may may have a tendency to raise voter turnout and engagement, and some of them might have a tendency to bring it down. Except that I think that, you know, when, when we take a look at the specific programs that are offered in which parts of which campuses, uh, when I take a look at um, the uh, bodies um, uh, uh, that, that attend downtown campuses, I, I think we're, we're probably talking largely international and therefore uh, not going to be voting. So, uh, again, this is where... Uh, it's important. Um, I think it's important to where sometimes it's not just the voices of voters that politicians look at at what's important, but it's the voices of those in power. This is the reason why the Windsor Works report brought brought out uh, leaders of uh, in our community, uh, both uh, presidents of both post-secondary institutions in our community um, uh, came to that to speak to it, and et cetera. So um, when we do take a look at War Three, we should remember that not only 
do some counselors around the table see it as the destination in which we want to, you know, be world stage all the time uh, and look at it from that lens, uh, from the visitor, from the outside lens to the uh, really progressive on the ground work of, you know, counselors like Reno Borland, but also I think uh, Fabio and um, Chris Holt and Karen McKenzie, some that are there and, and in, a, in a growing way also, uh, Jim Morrison and Gary understanding that, um, you know, people will go and visit a downtown core where other people love to live, right? Like, I mean, it, it's just something that, that we should take a look at when you have happy people living there. Um, it's also a happy place to visit and work and all those things. But uh, it also is, you know, home to uh, campuses. So, you, you know, just sort of referring to what you're talking about, Doug, you know, when you have this self-contained campus in South Windsor, um, that's a whole other thing than taking campuses. And we all applauded when we started, you know, seeing it happen, uh, both by the college and by the university having downtown campuses. But by saying we have downtown campuses, that means the downtown is our campus, is our backyard, that, um, that there are stakeholders, that the students and that the institution itself sees. It's not the building um, that, that goes to the end of the sidewalk. But that, that what is going on around the downtown core, the people living there, the people working there, the businesses, the other things happen, the amenities, the public spaces there are all part of hopefully drawing students into our community and saying, you, you want to be part of this downtown campus. Um, and, and so why is that? And so this is really, really important that I think that politicians should see that, you know, it's not just the number of votes that come out of there but also the stakeholders who you invite uh, to consult. And, you know, it's not about trotting them out once uh, every six years when you commission a report um, that they should come and support, but an ongoing and engaging conversation of what the needs of everybody's sort of constituents are. And in post-secondary education, the, the, the constituents are the students. And what does that mean? And what does that look like? And by that, I think that it's an important role for the leadership of those institutions to have that ongoing conversation as well. I think that that's probably the best place that we could leave this talking about that type of ongoing consultation and engagement. It's the theme that comes up episode after episode, but I do just want to reiterate something that you said, Pat, I found really interesting. People want to visit an area of the city that other people live in. And I thought that was a really, really apt quote. I've never, you know, heard it put that way. And it sort of hit me like a a brick wall out of nowhere. Because if you think about it, it's really true. I mean, what, where do people go in the city? Like, what are the things that people do? There's commercial districts, there's the BIA districts, um, but they're not all really wrapped around residential in the same way that the downtown core is. And there are a lot of people who live in the core, and we've talked about this throughout the show now, who, and, you know, outside of the direct core, but still in Ward 3, who are getting the, uh, you know, the, the bad side of a, you know, shake of the stick, I'm putting together too many metaphors here, um, who are being, you know, ignored, because as I mentioned at the top, or at least or how I feel, it's this amusement park fun zone. And it's easy to point to the big, shiny, bright objects without really looking at what the underlying issues are, what people need, what the actual services that the city is supposed to provide. I mean, we could we could get back onto talking about uh, shoveling sidewalks when it snows. I mean, we're talking about the very real issues that affect people where they live in the city. But with that, this is Ward 3 Watch for 2022. We will be back next week. We'll be diving into Ward 4. We're keeping this going straight through until we finish up with, I guess, the Mayor's Ward Watch. So if you have any you know, local news that you want us to get to over the next couple of weeks, you're going to have to really be a mover and shaker out there and try to make it a current event for us. Otherwise, we're looking back on the past term of council as we keep going. Our regular panel tonight for our Ward 3 Watch was myself, John Lidke, Don Merrifield Jr., Pat Papadeus, and Doug Sartori. Support us at patreon.com forward slash Rose City Politics. Check us out in BizX Magazine or at bizxmagazine.com. We're on all of your favorite social media and podcasting apps. And as always, Rose City Politics is able to broadcast live on tape thanks to the kind support of Leuna 625, Building Better Communities. We will see you next week, folks. <laughs>